Good evening and welcome to our Film at Lincoln Center virtual event for members. My name is Alicia Dixon. I'm the Development Associate with Film at Lincoln Center and I'm so glad all of you decided to join us tonight for a live Q&A about the Hulu original series, The Great. We're pleased to have executive producer Tony McNamara, executive producer and star Elle Fanning, and star Nicholas Holt for tonight's conversation, moderated by Rolling Stone's chief television critic, Alan Seppenwall. Alan is the author of several books about television, including The Sopranos ses Sessions, excuse me, uh, The Revolution Was Televised, and TV Book. This event marks one of the many virtual programs that we're thrilled to offer our members and patrons during the closure of our theaters. Um, before we get the conversation underway, I'd like to first highlight some organizational updates. Um, this Friday, we'll, we have a Don Porter's documentary, John Lewis, Good Trouble, opening up in our virtual cinema. Uh, be sure to check this out ahead of the free talk scheduled on Monday, July 6th. Uh, also opening in our virtual cinema is Ulrich Kohler's debut feature, Bungalow, and a selection of early shorts from filmmaker Miguel Gomez. Um, tonight also would not be possible if not for the commitment of our members, so thank you all so much for your continued support. Uh, I'd also like to thank American Airlines, the official airline for Film at Lincoln Center. Uh, if you're not a Film at Lincoln Center member and you're watching this special conversation on YouTube, um, Film at Lincoln Center is a nonprofit organization that has been New York's home for cinema since 1969. Uh, it would not be possible without the support of our incredible members, and we hope you'll consider joining today. Learn more about membership at filmlink.org. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Alan. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. So um, it's great to be here tonight. Oh, God, I already started off by saying great. I'll stop that now. That'd be the last use of that adjective for a while. But it's a, re it's a real pleasure to have you guys here. Tony, I want to start with you. Uh, this was a play uh, that you then tried to make into a movie until it eventually wound up in this form. How has it evolved over the years of you working on it? Um, well, I guess just like that. I mean, it was a play, and then we tried to turn it into a... Oh, we wrote a screenplay, and then... Um, and then over time, we were trying to get that up. But I was working a lot in TV, and um, eventually, I think I just thought it's a better, it's just obviously better TV. You know, it's a big story and needs a lot of time. So as soon as I decided that, it just sort of happened, sort of like it was the right thing. So uh, it just sort of fell into place. How would you say that. that the play differs from the, the show that we've seen? Um, shorter. No, I think, I think um, it doesn't differ that much. I mean, stylistically, it's very much the same. I mean, the world is bigger. There's more characters. Um, but the shape of the season is not unlike the, the, the play, in a way. It's her coming to Russia and trying to overthrow Peter. So that sort of similarities, obviously, it's 10 hours versus 45 minutes. So it's a much bigger more expansive, more complicated story and a much more character. It's much more compl complex characters in the TV show than the play, probably. Writers talk all the time about how they, how they have to kill their darlings, especially if you're working in a more limited time format like a play or like a movie. What's something that wound up in this season that, there's no way, that you love that there's no way you would have been able to do in a tighter window? Um... I, mean, I think there's an episode, episode eight, where we just go to the dacha on the lake in the middle of Russia and we do a whole sort of sub-story with this Swedish king and queen that, that is partly like the joy of television because it's, it's not, we didn't have to do it in a way. Like there were other quicker ways to tell the, the beat of Catherine and Peter's story that we were telling. But it just seemed fun and... So we sort of peeled off and had this, you know, great production design place that I really loved and really wanted to do something at. And it was, it's just things like that where you can kind of go, here's like a 30 minute story within our whole story that isn't necessary, but it's a really great way to tell it and a really fun way to tell it that you couldn't otherwise do in a shorter format. And what about this particular time in Catherine's life was really interesting to you because her story has been told many times in many different periods. Yeah, that's true. I, because I think that for me, the start is the most interesting bit is how this 
kid really comes to a country she doesn't know the language she marries wakes up and has married the wrong man and somehow her response to that is to take the country over um and that seemed interesting and and also what's interesting is how you then run a country down the line when we get there but um so that's the most interesting part even though most of the and i think most of the shows are focused on the later catherine and older catherine um so but this seemed like the really uh fun the fun one to me Ellen Nicholas, did you have any real interest in Catherine before you wound up doing this? Had you read anything about her or seen any of the other movies made about her? I hadn't. No, I I knew very little about her. I think, um, yeah, to be perfectly honest, pretty much nothing. And I still know fairly little apart from what I learned through the scripts. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I. Yeah, I have to agree. I, I didn't know um, much about her, and I haven't seen any of the um, any of the other movies or shows that have been made about her. There was something that popped on the TV. There's one, well, I can't remember which one it was, but I watched a little bit of that one, whichever one it was <laughs> that I'm thinking of, <laughs> for a little bit, and I was, I was uh, um, interested by it. Um, but I didn't, obviously, I didn't do... Um, much, you know, uh, reading about her beforehand. I felt like I learned that she invented the roller coaster and I felt, wow, okay, she's, um, she's a fun person. Like I get her personality. Um, and Tony's scripts were kind of the Bible and the guiding light for me because it is such a specific tone. And I think I was more interested in making her human and creating our own new version of Catherine that we haven't seen before but obviously you know the spirit of the real Catherine and what, what she did is still in our show it's just told you know in in not the BBC way <laughs> um it's definitely in a different way so yeah I didn't you know we're not it's we're, we're not a historical document but at the same time I think it does do justice to her because people are now looking her up a bit more I mean people I only knew that she basically the horse rumor. So um, <laughs> for me that, you know, it's pretty sad. This woman who was quite extraordinary and kind of the first feminist icon has been reduced down to this rumor when she did so much um, for a country. Well, Tony, uh, some of the episodes open with a disclaimer in, in the credit sequence, an occasionally true story. What does that phrase mean to you? How much fidelity, if any, did you feel you had to show here to the facts? I think it was, uh, I think there were things in her story like events uh, I was keen to do, but I certainly wasn't keen to do them in a chronological order. Or, and I certainly wasn't uh, slavish to it. I think it's like I said, I mean, it's more the essence of this uh, woman and what she was trying to do that we're faithful to. We're not really faithful to all the sort of facts and, and a rigorous detail of it because that's like a history lesson and this is this is a drama and a comedy it's not a history lesson um so and you know so that was always the take on it was like if it felt like true to her and the spirit of her um then if, and it was true we would put it in you know and it fit the way we were telling the story and the tone of the story often um made our choices you know i would certain things happened that were real and if that felt like the tone of the show they could go in and if it didn't and it seemed a bit more a dull sort of period thing we wouldn't do it you know so but mostly it was about just does that feel like our Catherine you know even with the disclaimer the world loves to nitpick so have any of you encountered people going well actually Catherine didn't do this or that like what's the most annoying one of those any of you has encountered over the time since the show debuted What's weird is I haven't had any of that. I, I haven't had that, but I remember um, when we were in the pitches, I won't say who, but Tony, you remember, we had, we were pitching, it wasn't Hulu, we were pitching to someone else. And the, the head person was like, well, I am a history major and I actually studied, studied um, Russian history. So, you know, basically we're not going to like your show and they they didn't you know <laughs> they didn't make it but uh, <laughs> I remember that <laughs> I'm like okay <laughs> but yeah I don't know have you guys got any 
people kind of nitpicking? I've had no one nitpicking. I've had a few people be like, hey, it seems like you played it really spot on and that's exactly like Peter the Third was. So so congratulations. <laughs> well done. <How's> that? <laughs> From people who knew him personally. Yeah. You know, you know what I think? I did actually get a comment that wasn't nitpicking the other day. It was someone being like, hey, I did study history. This isn't exactly what happened, but I still loved it. And it was actually very different. Like there are some true things in there, but it was also just a fun way for me to kind of look at this story from a different, from a different standpoint. So that was someone who did know and love history, but also appreciated what Tony had done with it. Nicholas, having played Tony's writing before, what was the appeal of, of coming back to work with him again and to play this character? Uh, I mean, I had, I had the best time making the favorite. I just think it's the, the most original dialogue I've ever, I've ever been allowed to, to do. And also um, just really brilliant writing. So, so the idea of playing Peter, this character that's like really comes alive on the page was something that um, I was just excited by it. Kind of something that I read it and I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's a fun character. And I had a good sense in my head of what to try and do with him. And then, the more and more scripts I saw as Tony kind of carried on writing through through the series, the the more intrigued I was by how he was evolving and, and the different facets of the character that I was getting to see on the page. And, and that just gave me more and more um, as an actor to try and to try and get in there and have fun with. Tony, is it as reductive as you saw him doing something on the set one day on the favorite and said, that's, that's my Peter, or was it a more complicated process than that? Not really, it was pretty much that. It was pretty much... <laughs> It was pretty much one day in rehearsal, you know, like we were in rehearsal for, I think, three weeks on The Favourite, and uh, I think just watching Nick read it, and um, it just, I just felt, I just, it was just, like, instinctive, I was just like, oh, that's Peter, you know, if uh, if you would be so kind as to do that. Um, so, yeah, so it was as sort of simple as that. El, had you and Nicholas stayed in touch since the last time you worked together? No, no, no. <laughs> I think we had seen each other at like, you know, events and things, but I was so young. Um, I was 14 when I did that. It was like so crazy. I, I was married and pregnant with your child. I was like a kid. In the film. In the film. <laughs> in the film. <laughs> um, <Word disclaimer. laughs> and, but what's so strange, yeah, we have this, like history of bad marriages um with that but um obviously it was like you know our show's a lot about destiny and fate and like there was something it's just like our destiny to do this show together and work together again I think it just had to happen because we are very similar actors like in a we work in a very similar way and we just we're on the same page. And I feel like that, I mean, it's, you know, that's not always the case, but it's so important with something like this and, and a show, you know, where you're trying to keep track of where you are in the different blocks and you're going from episode to episode and um, sometimes doing, you know, two different episodes in the same day and just like, just the pace of it, and, like going down to the technicalities of it, like you need a strong support. Um, I felt like we were that for each other. Um, for those six months, which is so important. Now, Nicholas, was Elle, was her process basically the same as an adult as it was when she was 14 and you worked with her? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't remember what? your... <laughs> your <laughs> I think the thing that we have up in the industry where we kind of have learned from other actors and, and like grown-ups when we were kids watching them do different things, depending on the job, depending on the character who's, I think like, who's directing. It's also something. like as a kid, as a kid, you just have to be flexible because you're like going to be thrown into a situation like, oh, this actor is like, wants me to call him dad. Like, okay, like, all right. You know, <laughs> like, it's just like, and you're just, you're a kid. So you're learning from everybody and you're, you know, just picking up along the way what really works for you. So I think that is true that we kind of, whatever works for that specific thing, going along. Was there any talk of, of 
Elle using her, her natural accent to play Catherine since she's already not a, a native to Russia. I know sort of British being the historical accent for every country is a tradition, but since she was an outsider, did you guys talk about that? No, not really. We pretty much set the accent as the RP English and um, that was it really. We didn't really talk about it other than Nick wanted to do a Russian accent occasionally. Just randomly. <laughs> I assume you shot that down. <laughs> to my discredit. Yeah. <laughs> now, Tony, earlier when you were talking about um, needing room to, to deal with the tone of it, the tone of the show is really fascinating to me because it's sometimes it's incredibly dark, sometimes just utterly silly. It can be pure comedy. At other times, we're meant to take Catherine's emotions very, very seriously. How did you figure out how elastic the tone was and, and what sort of actions or behavior or things could break the tone and make the, the different pieces not work together? Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it, sort of in the writing of it and the playing of it and designing it and everything, it was all just like truthful from character. It felt like if we, would, if we wrote the truth of the character, then if it was a really dramatic moment for that character or then that's what it was. And if it was Peter, you know, being absurd, then that, that was true. We weren't like, so it was sort of this idea that if we wrote it tr with the comic truth, dramatic truth, but we never pulled, we never were like tipping too hard either way, I suppose. But it was just always that idea of a really funny, very dark show that was narratively a drama, but executed like a comedy, I guess. And Ellen Nicholas, is that something you really had to keep in mind when you were playing the roles or you're just sort of playing the, the scene in front of you and letting everybody else worry about whether it fits together? <laughs> I'll go. Um, I, think, um, I think it was interesting. I mean, it definitely felt like walking a tightrope and you were aware that you were doing a show that had a specific tone and you wanted the tone to come across in a certain way. So you had to be aware of it, but then you, I felt like at times I would also have to forget it because I'm trying to play a character that has these real emotions and is dealing with very real high stakes and you want the audience to, to feel that. You don't want them to just laugh and put it aside. It has to be real. So I think it all came from a very truthful place, but then also I had to be willing to like uh, kind of embarrass myself sometimes. And I think that's where the comedy came in. Like I had to learn to just go for it, which was new for me. And, um, you know, and, and like rhythm and timing is so specific with Tony's writing, which um, Nick obviously because coming from the favorite really um, got that down. So he would keep my rhythm up and, and be aware of that. But then in, in other words, I was really, I don't, I was playing, trying to play a real human, even though bizarre things are happening, that was our world. You know, our world has to be real to us. So you're like, keep it in mind, but then just put it way in the back of your mind. <laughs> so what's <laughs> a scene where time. you felt that you were embarrassing yourself or you felt like I have to embarrass myself to make this work? Um... Um, oh, what uh, I, I love this. I love the scenes with them um, when I have when I pee on the wheat. I love all those scenes and specifically the scene. I think it's in episode 10 when I have to hold in the pee. <laughs> and I'm like with uh, Aunt Elizabeth and I'm like in that scene. I was I wasn't really committing to it. There was something I was like when someone has to pee. I was like, wait, 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 we need to we and I had to redo it because I was like, no, like and the release of that, like, <laughs> when you have to pee so bad, and like, you're just uh, like, I was like, okay, I wasn't going for it enough. I was like, I need to just commit and do this. So I'm, I'm glad I did. <laughs> and Nick, do you like, have any thoughts on, on the tone question? <laughs> I thought you were gonna ask about the peeing on the wheat. Um, <laughs> we can talk about that too, if you want. <laughs> uh, no, um, I, I, th I think it's what Tony said before, is the kind of this thing where, yeah, for us as actors, we just have to play it completely honest and straight in many ways and the, and the humor comes from the situation or, or the dialogue so it's kind of not trying to play up any of the comedy you can see on the page what's funny but not trying to play it as funny I guess and just um, play it very honest as, as Elle was saying so um, 
so it's that and yeah just being truthful to the character i guess um but yeah i was fortunate where kind of yorgos his approach on the favorite kind of broke down um an actor's instinct in some ways to try and do too much with the script and and so it kind of t stopped you from doing that so it kind of being part of that process made me kind of be able to look at this in kind of a simple way in terms of approaching it as an actor and not trying to do too much, I guess. So when you guys, you're sitting in the banquet hall and you're having to pluck eyeballs out of these severed heads that have been served in front of you, sort of, A, what's the atmosphere on the set like that day, but also what what's going through your heads as actors as you're doing this scene? I, I I just found a video from behind the scenes. Well, El, what's the song you're singing? You're making you're making the the it's seven. It's a heads. tiny Tim, right? Tiny tiptoe through the tulips. God, I was making the severed head sing that song, kind of as a puppeteer. <laughs> so that's kind of the, the atmosphere, I guess. Yeah. Wow. Were there things in the script that you didn't necessarily? think were funny and then in the playing of them you realize oh this is a comedy scene i think the, the things that didn't necessarily see you wouldn't read as being that funny until you did them was more the physical humor i guess kind of if it was one of our intimate scenes or some of those scenes where it's like you read it on the page but then when you're actually adding the physical motions on top of the dialogue then it becomes very amusing or well, that's to me anyway um I think. yeah and then some scenes that are meant to be funny weren't <laughs> like what I'm, I'm trying to think i just remember because we would have we had we were fortunate to like have table reads before um each episode and you would do the table reads and you would just like nail that joke and like the room would be laughing like everyone would be like, yes like you got it. But then it was like, that's a table read. So then on the day, when you're doing those scenes, you know, over and over and over again, the crew's just like, ugh, like, you know, this is just not, you know, they don't think it's funny anymore. And you're like, oh, gosh, are we funny? Is this good enough? And then I, you know, I guess it has a different life um, in the editing room. They can make us look good. But it was interesting, that whole, the, you know, just, I don't know, that, that side of comedy because you don't realize, you know, it's, this is not the type of comedy where we're, we get to ad lib or anything. It's like, these are, it was the strictest script supervisor I've ever had, <laughs> um, rightfully so, you know, but, um, so yeah, it doesn't, we, you, you have to change it up in a different way. Like the words are there. So then you have to find like freedom in looking at it in a different way. I don't know if that's like comes from, physicality or just else oh, let's try it this way or I don't know I feel like Nick and I we experimented a lot in that makes sense <laughs> now one refrain I've heard a lot from people who love the show as much as I did is they would talk about the the sex scenes between Peter and Catherine and how they didn't feel like anything they had seen before on film because they're it's so strange and so uncomfortable in a lot of ways uh tony first of all like how important are those scenes to making the show work and what what was your goal with them uh i think my goal with the sex scenes was that they all were a reflection of the character's relationship and the dynamic between people um so catherine and peter had a very functionary no, I, you know, neither of them were that interested in it. They were like there to have a baby. And that was different from Madame Dimov and Peter or uh, Leo and Catherine. Or I just wanted the sex to not be like generic, every sex scene is a TV sex scene. It was, it was like, well, what would it be? And what's our version of it? And so that it wasn't, so, so that it was just, it was just that character thing. It was like, well, what is sex to these people? And how much sex is there? And it's like, well, they're trapped in a giant apartment building, drinking a lot of vodka. Of course, there's a lot of sex. So um, that was sort of the take on it. Was each each time we talked about each time people had sex, we talked about why. And I was, you know, um, to the directors, like I sort of wanted it a certain way, and and why I wanted it that way. Now, filming sex scenes is you know, is always a pretty delicate thing, but but L for you and Nick, was it? 
for such terrible sex between them. And so Tony said, functionary. You broke up a little bit. Right? All right, let me try I, that again. Had, uh, had sex scenes are usually kind of delicate to play. <laughs> terrible sex. But the fact, uh, was it more or less delicate because it's supposed to be this really terrible, almost business-like sex that Tony was describing for, for you guys to play? Like, what was the atmosphere like when you had to do those sequences together? Hilarious. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, I would be like laughing most of the time, like biting down on a pillow and like, just like Nick would be like, okay, L, I'm not gonna look at your eyes. Like I'm gonna just look at your ear so we can get through this and I can say the words and we don't bust up laughing. Like, okay, good. Like, I won't look at you. Don't worry, I won't look at you. Um, so that was pretty much that. Um, I think that, again, we just, we felt so comfortable with each other that, we wanted to make it right. And we had a intimacy coordinator on set, which I had never had before. That was interesting, um, you know, to make sure everything is safe and you feel comfortable, but also to make sure the sex looks real. So I, I really enjoyed that. They would, you know, kind of give tips of like, well, it doesn't really look like you guys are lined up in the right way or just like little <laughs> technical things like that yeah. to, you know, make it look right. Um, which I, I never experienced that. Um, but I think, you know, sex is such a huge part of our show. Um, but the sex is not portrayed in a vulgar way. I feel like the vulgarity is more in our language on the show. Um, so I think it, they, it's like Tony was saying, like each sex scene really mm -hmm. serves it its purpose and it's there for a reason and, and sex was also such a big part of the real Catherine the Great's life she was kind of the first the you know was the first to be like slut shamed in a way the horse rumor was totally slut shaming um because she had a lot of lovers but um so yeah I was, I was happy to have that be you know something that was really was on the show in two different ways like Catherine's finding her sexuality as well, and um, but yeah, with I mean those scenes and those days were, were pretty um, funny, honestly. <laughs> was it a set where, in general, you guys were breaking up a lot, or for the most part, you were able to keep it together until you know, the director said cut? We weren't I, good at it. <laughs> yeah, I break a lot, and then and then it's very difficult because once you go, like, you can see like a little twitch or twinge in the other person's face, or like when you know someone else is clinging on for dear life to get the end of the scene without giggling it's like and it's also i like corpsing i think it's really funny <laughs> once I, when something when something when something tickles me and gets in my head i find it really difficult and occasionally i have to like sit around and really like have a stern stern word with myself inside my head and be like come on these people have families to get home to and if you don't get through this next take you're a bad actor <laughs> was there a scene that was particularly insurmountable in that way where just it took you forever to get through it straight I definitely had trouble saying um, the line about blowing my bag in Madame Dimov. That line, <laughs> that line really <laughs> just tickled something on me, and I, I struggled with that. Or, or appraising Leo's uh, uh, member as well. When I had to look at his region and say "marvelous," for some reason that that <laughs> I struggled. I struggled with the process inside my head of of the marvelous as well. <laughs> Did it take, did you struggle at all with, with coming up with your delivery of huzzah? I know that there are several different huzzahs throughout, but like the, given that it's so much of Peter's signature, did you sort of have to really think about how am I going to say this? I really didn't. <laughs> Weirdly, I think at the beginning of the show, it kind of, I, would, I don't know, it was just kind of an exclamation and then it grew into more things because it could take on so many different meanings. But again, that was something that one of like the games we played when we were prepping for the favorite was we had to deliver a line of dialogue and then say what what at the end of it each line and so it kind of became that game was almost what Hazar became in this script where sometimes i'd find myself putting it in even if it wasn't in the script but it kind of it just kind of rolled on from the thought of whatever was going on in the character's brain so no i didn't really think about it specifically 
Tony, I want to talk about the, the language in general because it's not entirely modern and it's not entirely period. It's sort of this fluid thing that moves be between the two. What, what was your approach in, in coming up with the way that people would talk on this show? Yeah, it was just, um, it's just that really. I mean, it's like a hybrid language that uh, is a way for, I mean, I don't know how people talked. I don't know that any of us do. So uh, I think for me, it was about letting the audience in and it's, and I write in a particular rhythm. So uh, a really formal way of speaking wouldn't have, doesn't work with the way I write. So it was a mixture of like trying to make the show accessible in a contemporary way and also just creating a sort of an anarchy in a way that the show had a slightly anarchic feel genre wise and the language was part of that. And the sort of um, the sort of wild the sort of um, yeah the anarchy of it is what I wanted out of it and an ability for an audience not to be like sitting back watching it like it happened three hundred years ago I wanted it to feel like it was happening you know there was something very contemporary about it at the same time. L was that challenging to sort of be in these sort of two different modes of speech at once often often within the same you know couple of lines basically. Yeah, I mean, you definitely get, you know, you, you start to get used to um, the writing after a while. And um, honestly, with the, you know, the memorization, you realize, oh, your, your, that muscle starts to really work over time. Because in the beginning, it was, you know, it's hard to memorize the, <laughs> um, a bit, some of those long speeches and just the, the rhythm of it. Um, but also, I think that it, it, you were this is about the also the English accent about earlier it's like Tony's writing is so fit for that accent I think if I tried to say um, in my accent his, those words it just wouldn't sound right but it works with the cadence and the rhythm so actually having the accent helped me with the language and helped it kind of fit into my mouth better um, with that so that that definitely was helpful and with the memorization too because I I worked with a dialect coach and so every day we would, she'd be listening to my accent, but I'd also be learning the lines and getting the rhythm right. So um, yeah, it, it, but it, yeah, it, it, I've never, you know, I'll, I'll never probably talk again like I'm talking in this, in this show. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to audience questions in a minute, but first I want to give Ooh. you guys a chance to say nice things about one another. So Elle, let's start with you. What is your, like a thing you love that, Tony that Nick got to do uh in this role Nick got to do yeah sorry um gosh I think I'm so like <laughs> like looking at you uh when I watched huh. the show and like watching what Nick did with the character it's so it's incredible I don't think people realize really what he did because it also can be written off as, oh, he's the enemy, or he's just like, he, you know, is an idiot, and he does these things. And he's made Peter so, like, complicated and someone that you really care for and actually um, smart at times. Like, it's weird. I'll look and be like, well, Peter's kind of right. Like, I don't know what that says about me, but you've made me feel that way with what you did with him. Um, and, and it's so fun. Like you're just so uninhibited and like wild and like watching that on screen. I think that's what everyone loves and definitely what I did. So, but no one else could do it, but you, Thanks. but you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, now you have to return the favor. What's something that Elle did on the show that you loved? Oh God. I mean, every, every facet of the performance is brilliant. It's one of those where like in, in person, when I was watching, I'd be like, I'd be in the scene and occasionally, even when you're in a scene with someone, you can kind of step outside and be like, damn, that's good. You can kind of observe it from like an outside point of view. And it happened, it's only happened a couple of times when I'm watching other actors, but it definitely happened a lot watching Elle on this set. Um, but then getting to watch it back, I think she just managed to plot the arc of Catherine so beautifully through the series. Um, it's something that you, you watch every hesitation and beat and her being strong, but then doubting herself and then, learning the environment and you can see all of that through Elle and then also just like the heartbreaking moments of it of this this young strong powerful girl she's kind of contradiction of everything so it's kind of that tightrope 
that she managed to walk playing the character is is wonderful. I think. All right, let's go to some. Audience. But you know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, th Tony, this one's for you. This is from Dora. She says, can you discuss the political uh, satire elements of the show? I know that's a bit broad. Like, with, were, were there any current parallels you were looking at that you had in mind, perhaps, while you were writing it? Uh, not in a literal sense. I mean, I think we were aware. Um, I mean, there was no, like, literally, we're doing this and it's about the, the modern world. But we were very, like, conscious, or I was very conscious of, in having a contemporary feel and so we were very like we did a lot of study of uh, activism modern activism and change and because that is what she sort of becomes is and is trying to do she's trying to change a society so I, I don't know how it fed in literally to the writing it was just something I was aware of and we did some research about and we talked a lot about how people change and how they get other people to change and so there was, that was the main element of it. And then any, uh, you know, anything that sort of jives now with what's happening is, is sort of, uh, you know, a bit of just writers being, even if you're writing about a period of time, you're, sort of, you're always sort of writing your own world in a way. All right, this question is from Marshall. It's for Elle and Nick. Were either of you drawing from unconventional inspirations outside of royalty or politics to inform your characters? Yeah. Hmm. Gosh. There, no, there, was, I yeah. there was one, there was one, I won't say the name, but there's one musician that I kind of slightly imagined this character being like. Um, that, like, I, and I don't know why, it was just something in my head whenever I imagined the character, I was like, oh, this is kind of like that person. And I've never met this person, I have no <laughs> real viewpoint or standpoint to put that from, but I was like, you know, this young person who has everything. And like, I don't know, there was just something in my head that I was like, oh, I kind of can draw. But then I, I had never based any, I think that was just a, from a mindset place. There was no, there was no like, oh, I'm going to kind of try and behave or mimic or be like that person at all. Yeah, I don't know. I yeah, I don't know. I, I had seen I um, like bringing up baby and like Catherine Hepburn and how like she's so like that Spitfire like, um, and, and I mean obviously she's like the greatest. But I think when going into comedy, a lot of people reference her, like watch her films. Um, so that so yeah, great, always inspiration. Um, April wants to know how long did the whole season take to shoot uh, and did you do one episode at a time or were you doing bits of each and going back and forth we really did we did like two at a time I mean we did the pilot then we did two at a time uh, I think the shoot all up is about five months five or six months um, and then and with pre-production a couple of months pre-production Right. Um, Amy wants to know, can you discuss the decision to cast so much diversity within the supporting actors? Uh, yeah, I mean, it just seemed, it's just like what we wanted to do. I, I mean, we were making a show that is in contemporary, I mean, it's set in Russia, so there's that, but it's sort of like a show now, it should reflect the world and it should just be draw the actors we need and um, so it was sort of that. I mean, I was just like, that's just makes sense to me. I don't know why, you know, shows aren't all like that in a way. So that was our decision. And, you know, even in, and then, you know, I think after that re research wise, it, it's sort of a falsehood that all these courts did weren't diverse, you know? So, so there was a diversity in, you know, Russia's on the edge of, you know, has borders the Middle East and it borders like, um, Asia and so there was this sort of diversity within it so we just it was just a decision we made that that's what we wanted to do and that seemed important so we did it. All right Tony there's another one for you this is from Sabrina uh, who says a frequent theme of stories set in the 18th century is the idea of excess was there a focus on legitimizing Catherine's character as a feminist icon by removing her from some of the excess of royalty? Is that something you were thinking about as you were writing this? Not really, because um, 
I don't know. I have it in excess, I guess. Like the jewels and I don't know. You have the question again. No. <laughs> Um, no, she's just asking basically like be because Catherine, as, as we've talked about, is sort of a feminist icon, often when you have movies about royalty in this period, it's just a lot of gluttony yeah. and and there's certainly some of that in this, but it's she's not the one steering it, definitely. She's not really interested in the access yeah. of Alice Lane. No, I think it's a, it wasn't really about the, I mean, it was just like who, who is she as a person and what she interested in. And we were always like, when we talked about the character, we were like, she's interested in ideas. She's interested in, so in, in a kind of, when you're making a show, you're sort of reducing in a way to what are the essences of people. And um, Peter was interested in excess fun and excess drinking and excess amazing food. And she was interested in change and ideas. And so it was more representing the sort of central elements of what she was interested in. So we didn't consciously do it. We probably consciously not do it we just consciously chose what is the most important things to her because that's what she's driving towards All right, michelle wants to know if if each of you have a favorite scene from the series i mean i know that a couple of the favorite scenes fred and i have to do were the kind of two confrontational scenes in the final episode episode um just because the written scenes but have so many bits and back and forth and the characters are kind of upping each other and, and and it's kind of what we've been building to i guess up until that point so that's definitely those two definitely so just the freshness in my memory at this point um uh the other one that i got reminded about the other day that i kind of forgotten was in the in the in the episode where peter gets um poisoned and there's a scene that i got to do where he um he defecates vomits and ejaculates at the same time <laughs> and i don't think it was something that i'd ever thought i'd do as an actor but it was really <laughs> funny <laughs> and just a challenge in in ways that i never expected <laughs> has alan frozen <laughs> oh, can you top that <laughs> oh man um i can't top that no, I can't stop that. Um, it was funny because, Alan, you froze for a second there with kind of a disgusted look on your face. And I was like, oh, okay. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. No, it's all, it was not disapproval. It's just my bad Wi-Fi. It's all good. Uh, Sharon wants to know. I'm sorry, Sharon wants to know about the costumes. Um, first of all, Tony, like, what were your inspirations? Was it just you were going for period specific, or you wanted it to look like? Something. No, we were, we were sort of not going for period specific. Or well, we were going for, um, I think the base, uh, there's a baseline of it, which is shape wise, there's a period out, there's a sort of, there's a sort of baseline truth to the shapes and the kind of silhouettes and stuff. And then from there, we, we sort of, Emma and Holly sort of built their own, which was always the brief, it was like, you know, just it's period, but it's our world, so we're creating our own world up to a point. So, uh, so from there, it was like just, you know, every episode we talked through what what it should be and how we wanted to change things as we went, and then, um, you know, we would all and Al would come in, come in, and we'd talk at Nick, and we'd sort of just all talk about what it felt like for characters and where each. So we did actually spend a lot of time talking about costumes and and making them our own thing in a way, but still making it look period. But they're very much our own viewer things, I suppose. Uh, uh, Al, Doreen wants to know if you can talk about the specifics of your role as executive producer as well as star. Ah, um, yeah, I mean, this was something that I, Tony, you know, I asked me to be a part of and um, it's something I've been interested in for such a long time, I think because I, was a young actor being on set. So I've just always been so curious about pulling the curtain back and going behind the scenes and seeing kind of the inner workings. And I also think I have a, a very, when I'm on set, like even acting, I like see things um, in an editing way. Like I, I wanna know where the camera is. I wanna, I, I, it's, you know, I'm, I'm in there, but I, I'm in the scene, but also, 
there's other things going on. So I was excited to, to, um, you know, learn more. I think my, like Catherine, I had to kind of find my voice in that role. Um, so we were kind of experiencing the same thing at the same time, but I would, you know, watch dailies and cuts and, and experiencing that while filming something. Um, it was interesting how you just have to separate your mind. You know, you can't judge yourself. You're looking at something as a whole. And, um, yeah, it was, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I love being a part of it. When you're so passionate about thing and, and want it to do well, it's, uh, you know, it adds, it adds so much more. Uh, April wants to know, will there be a season two? Uh, she'd love to see it, as would I. Well, <laughs> we hope so. I mean, we're, we're, we should find out soon. And we're, I think from, uh, we think it's done, it's done really well. So we're uh, expecting it to hopefully be a season two. We want to do well. Well, that seems like a very good note to end on. So thank you guys for a terrific panel on behalf of a terrific show. I didn't say the word twice, so I feel good about that. <laughs> uh, on behalf of Film at Lincoln Center, I'd like to thank the creators and stars of The Great for talking with me tonight and everybody in the audience for watching. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Nice. Bye. Bye.